for coming back to the CEO for Life Experience. This is your host, Rob Barber, and we are here today with another amazing guest for you. Um, I've been actually giddy as a as a kid on Christmas morning waiting for this one because I have with me um, Paolo Gallo. He is uh, a business consultant, coach. Um, he is a author of Compass and the Radar, which is an amazing book, and I'm, I'm going to let him talk a little bit about that, but we're going to get into some real good conversation. Paolo, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks so much for inviting me here today. Thank you. Awesome. Well, as uh, if you are have been listening to the podcast or watching the vlog, you know that I stalk some of the best guests and uh, and through that process have uh, have listened to some talks from Paolo and uh, and read a lot about him. And so I'm happy to have him here. If you if you please go and do some more research about Paolo, look him up on LinkedIn, go look at some of his past content, you know, his TEDx talks, his keynotes, they're super, super great. Go beyond just this experience. So Paolo, let's jump into this just a little bit. So you have this book and this is, you know, one of the things that first caught my attention was the compass in the radar. And it talks about the morals and our values and our foundation. And in the book, CEO for life, I, I talk about that too. We have to have a foundation where we come from. I'd love to get your perspective on why you wrote this book and why that was important for you. Well, thank you. This is a meaningful question to, to reflect. And uh, basically, uh, in my professional life, I've been uh, human resource directors in uh, four different organizations in four different countries, in Italy, in the United States, in England, and uh, more recently in Switzerland, where I'm, I'm talking to you right now. No? And so I was reflecting on, on, a, on a two very simple questions. I'm a coach and therefore I think uh, starting from a question is a very meaningful start to say, mm, uh, what does it mean having a successful career and uh, what do you need to have a successful career? No? And uh, because as head of human resources, I've seen a thousand of careers, some of them end up brilliantly well and some of them were a total disaster. And I was wondering why, because uh, a little like marriages, when, when you get married, you, you hope and you think it's going to work, but regrettably, it's not, only, it's not always the case, no? So to me, I, I reflected on, uh, on two points. So what I think you need to have a successful career, regardless of the sector, the level, or the industry that you work, uh, is a radar. So the capacity to see, to have a big picture, to look outside the window, to anticipate trends and mega trends are going to impact your industry in a new job. And a compass, which is a capacity to respond to a very simple question, which is what do you stand for? Uh, so what, what are the things that you value? What are the things that you believe make sense to you as an individual? And then the second question, what does it mean having a successful career? Uh, to me, cannot be measured exclusively by uh, promotions, uh, money, power, and uh, corner office, stock option, and company car. Is to do something that, in my view, is more uh, meaningful, which is uh, related to uh, impact uh, on on the work that you do to society and to the people around you, what you learn and what, and fundamentally, if you love what you're doing. Uh, and so, if you have um, uh, an approach in which a successful career is defined by you are successful only you get to the top, uh, then you're excluding 99.9% .9 of the people from that game because not everybody is going to become a CEO, not everybody is going to become a pope uh, or a dean of a university. You know? But if you think about a broader sense, a broader and more meaningful, which is about the learning, the loving, and the impact that you have on others then it's something that uh, each of us can achieve uh, and therefore the success could be um, not easier, but more meaningful in your journey. You know, Paolo, this is an interesting thing because, um, you know, I, I did some time in HR too. And, and so as I was listening to you, I was thinking over some, some things that I went through and, and, and what, what, what stood out to me is someone listening to this may think, oh, this soft stuff about morals and, values and ethics how's that really going to make me successful and those kind of things and what i immediately came to was i remember a few instances where some decisions were made by leadership um, that were beyond ethical um you know if downright not criminal but the people underneath them chose not to say something about it right and so maybe let's have a little discussion around this maybe someone listening today is in a organization where the leadership doesn't have a whole lot of moral foundation or a compass as you write in the book. Should somebody stay there? I mean, what is your thoughts on that? Can, can the leadership change? Do you sit and wait it out? Do you need to make a change? Walk through some of that thought process. 
Matt, listen, perhaps uh, let me be extremely practical because uh, regardless of the country, we are still in the middle of the pandemic, no? Right. And it's interesting to see how people and organizations react to, to this, no? Uh, let me go back to one, one step uh, because we're in the middle of crisis. A crisis is a Greek word uh, that implies the need of taking a decision. So organizations took decisions in order to manage this crisis, okay? And some organizations have done wonderful work. Um, I'm quoting, I have no financial interest whatsoever, but let's say Ferrari, they put a system in place called Back on Track, uh, in which they have given uh, the, the vaccine and every possible uh, support for employees uh, and their families for them to return back on track uh, as soon as possible. Microsoft has uh, recently introduced uh, a well-being week uh, for every employee. The World Bank has introduced uh, policies for people to be, uh, let's say, um, uh, comfortable in returning back to the office and, uh, and recharge the energy. So, uh, and some organizations, they did the opposite. They, they obliged people to, uh, to work extremely hard. They have uh, not taken any, any safety measure for them and some of them got sick and some of them died. So ethic is not, you know, a bullet point on a job description, it's the way you are, it's your DNA. And then uh, there are some uh, huge uh, impact from the financial standpoint uh, uh, when a company is considered a reputable company or when it's not. I think, uh, and this is a point that I make quite, quite extensively, we're not in the information age, we're in the reputation age, because 75% of the value of organization are intangible assets. They're not anymore the plants, the walls, and the, and the, the mechanics, and the car, it's, it's the intangible assets. And, and the first one is, uh, is reputation. I mean, are you perceived to be in the marketplace a reputable company that are conducting business in an ethical way? Or you just don't give a damn and you cut corners. If you cut corners, you may get away the first or the second time, but eventually people start to get disengaged. And uh, I, I really believe eventually it's going to get you. And then uh, you, the, 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 the stock market collapse. And, and I have to say, my country, Italy, and your country, United States, has regret to be quite a lot of examples of, of organizations that they couldn't care less, uh, from Parmalat to uh, Enron. And, uh, and you saw the results from the community and for the people that work. So ethic is not a soft thing that some people talk just because they want to be kind of nice and cute or elegant or fashionable. It's actually the core of the business and the core of who you are as an individual and as a leader. And if you don't believe that this is the case, good luck to you because it's not going to work. <laughs> so, so let's maybe take it down a little bit more. And let's let's go 50 to like maybe 5,000 feet. So we talked about ethics are the way you are, and we're in this reputation age. And so in the book, CEO for Life, I try to bring that accountability down to the individual person and say, you may have a CEO, but you're also the CEO of your life. And you should run your life and your business and your career in that mindset or in that in that in that in that way. Walk through a little bit as an individual ethics or who you are and your reputation how important is it as the individual and part of an organization yes and i gave a, um, a ted talk literally two days ago which is going to be online in few day, in few days time and uh, i make a, an analogy which hopefully can be helpful okay let's say that you're a portfolio manager and i i live in geneva and in geneva there are a lot of private banks so the portfolio manager what what, what is their job the job is you have a certain uh, assets let's say $100 million, and after one year, I come back to you and to say, okay, Paolo, I gave you $100 million. What is the value of the portfolio? And my job is to increase the value of your portfolio. Now, let me ask a question to the people that are listening. If you manage, rather than a portfolio, your career, how do you increase the value of your professional career? Okay, it's a very simple question. And people tend to confuse the value of their career with their salaries. If I make a million, my, my, my career worth more than a guy that's making under 1,000. And it's a fair point. But if you focus exclusively on increasing your salary rather than increasing the value of, of your professional career, then you're missing the point. In my view, you increase your value by putting three elements in a row. Okay? The first one is, what do you know? Knowledge capital. 
knowledge capital, but the knowledge capital has to translate into results. So the example that I gave in the third talk, just to have some fun, if I were to say, I know by heart every recipe of Italian cuisine, but I don't know how to cook anything, you would not probably take me seriously because, okay, Paolo, you know a lot, you can do a dumb stuff, uh, and therefore you're not that credible. So knowledge capital has to take oh, some results. Okay, that's, that's easy. Second one is relationship capital. Relationship capital uh, is not about how many people you have on LinkedIn or Facebook or, or whatever. These are the followers. Is uh, how many people you trust and you have developed an, a, a relationship of trust, not based on authority. Just to be clear, if I'm your boss, it's kind of easy for me to say, can you do this for me? Because I'm your boss and your salary depends on me. Uh, if I don't have the power, the only thing that is, is left is my reputation and my trust, okay? So relationship capital should not be defined as how many people do you know, but how many meaningful relationships based on trust you developed, the last point, possibly in different bubbles, in different contexts, because different contexts will give you the diversity, the innovation, the creativity that you need in order to do your job. These two elements need to be multiplied by your reputation, and the reputation is fundamentally what people say about you when you're not there, okay? Or if you want, your reputation is a lot to do with what you're not prepared to do in order to achieve your goals. Let me be, let me be maybe blunt. Everybody wants to make more money, but uh, one thing is earning your money by working hard. One thing is earning your money by robbing a bank. So um, what, what I'm trying to say, we agree on the outcome, uh, is the modality of getting there says a lot about the person you are. No? So going back to the analogy that I used before, everybody wants to increase uh, the value of their professional career. And in order to do this, uh, keep on learning, but translate this learning in some practical results. Two, develop meaningful relationship with people, not based on authority, but based on trust uh, and uh, respect. And three, make sure that you keep your reputation uh, impeccable, because without that, uh, you're, you're, you're fundamentally dead on water. People will not work with you. And one of the things that I've learned by working in human resources for many years, head of, head of HR for many organizations, people are hired and recruit, hired maybe based on qualification, but promoted and grow based on their reputation, which fundamentally is not only important what they do, but how they do it. No? And, and, and therefore, to me, taking, taking care of this element is not just, as I said, an academic thing that some people have written in chapter six in their books. Yeah? It's bloody important in making sure that your career is meaningful. You know, so anyone who's listening to this or watching this right now, I, I, hope, I hope you weren't on two times speed or one and a half because this fellow just dropped some really great life strategy and business strategy on us. Talked about knowledge, relationship, and reputation. And when you were talking about it, Paolo, I had this, I had this picture in my mind of bar graphs, right? So my engineers coming out in me and mm -hmm. I, I, or, or, or a trend line. If I trend lined my knowledge, my relationships and my reputation, I could directly correlate that to my success, right? I mean, if there was a way to, to put numbers to it and I love that. So anyone who's listening, I want you to go back and really think that through because if we were to look at those three buckets of knowledge, relationship and reputation, how well you're going to do in life is how well those buckets are doing. And I, and I love that. I love that strategy, Paolo. That's awesome. One of the things that I talk about in the book specifically, and I want to dive into this one maybe a little bit more, is, is the relationship piece. And, you know, you're talking about the follows, the likes, those kind of things, which are very surface. One of the things I talk about in the book is, is divesting yourself of the relationships that aren't taking you where you want to go. What are your thoughts on that? I'd love to pick your brain on that. That's one of the things I wanted to make sure we talked about. Now, tell me, uh, can you reformulate the question so I can give some thoughts? Okay, yeah. So um, <clears throat> a lot of what happens in, in what I've seen in my clients and in my experience is that um, we're not able to level up to what, we're, what we want to be or to be the CEO for life because we have people in our sphere that are holding us back. Either they're either they're negative or they're a negative influence or, um, you know, they drag us down in one way or how do you begin to break free of those people in your life or in your work life in order to become the CEO for your life? 
What are your okay. thoughts on that? Uh, to me, I, I, I call it that once per year I do a social detox. And social uh -huh. detox means I eliminate from my, wife, my life uh, people that have proved to be toxic. And uh, let, let me be very specific. Uh, um, once, uh, and I want to put two, two conceptual elements uh, together, and then we have to, uh, uh, to you know, make sure that together makes sense. So one is uh, networking is fundamentally based on a very simple concept, what you could do for other people. So networking means uh, you offer yourself uh, to, to help. And uh, here I'm, I'm quoting Steve Convey book, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, the first, uh, you know, the seven habits of highly effective people to say relationships are like bank accounts. You have to deposit first uh, before withdrawing. Okay. Right. So you have to deposit. What do you deposit? You deposit trust. You deposit time. You, 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 you are available for people to listen. You do something for them. Okay, so this is the bedrock of, of in my view, uh, relationship and networking. The second one within this group, uh, and I'm going to tell you a funny story that actually happened today. You have the givers, uh, the matchers, and the takers. And the takers are people that are attracted to you uh, because they want something from you, no? which is okay. But then uh, eventually, if the only game that they can play is uh, I come to you, you have to be like an ATM to say, my friend, listen, credit line is over. You deposit <laughs> nothing. You're keeping withdrawing. You know, uh, as we say in my language, arrivederci, e, e ciao, I mean, goodbye. And, uh, and, and so what I'm trying to say, one of, one of the, the, the things that in my view are important is that uh, is to is to avoid that people take advantage of you. This in this beautiful book of Adam Grant, uh, Give and Take, uh, Adam, which I had the good fortune to work to to know quite well, he said, you know what? Um, yeah, try to be a giver, but don't be a giver forever for people that don't reciprocate. So there must be some matching contribution. No? And there are ways of understanding these people. Okay, uh, there are people that only talk about themselves. There are people that only uh, reach out to you when they need something. There are people that mysteriously disappear when you need them. Um, there are people that they, they have no shame in asking stupid stuff uh, or incredible stuff or outrageous stuff any moment of the day or the night. And uh, sounds like uh, teenage kids, by the way. <laughs> yeah, no, really, you do. I mean, I'll give you an example. You know, I won't tell the name of the person, but you know, a person has written a book. Say, Paolo, can can can. Uh, can you, can you give me an advice about my book? It's like, Jesus Christ, it was 350 pages. It's not something you do in 20 minutes. So I did spend a good three hours. I didn't read the entire book. And then I spent three hours in sending a message to say, this part is great. There are, so 10 days later, the guy said, oh, would you mind to write a forward of my book? Well, stupid me, I did. And then you know, after a month, I said, Paolo, by the way, as you sold up, you know, whatever number of copies for your book, can you give me some advice about my book? So I, I gave, I gave you a bit, of, a bit of time. But at that time, my wife said, Paolo, just, just, just leave this guy alone. He's a pain in the ass. So I did invest a bit more time. And then eventually, after five times, in which he asked me pretty much everything, I, I asked him a small little favor, literally near to nothing, uh, and the guy disappeared. So a good way of understanding if a person is a giver or a taker is uh, from time to time, Ask them to pay you a coffee. Um, and when I say a coffee, I mean something minimal, but meaningful. And then if these people disappear, just you, you're not losing a friend, you're losing a taker, and, and this is good. So main point is uh, invest in relationship, in giving your time, your energy, your good faith, your knowledge, your context to people. But also be mindful that some people will reciprocate, will be would be a, a, a joyful relationship with some people, let's say 30%, they are, they are happy to be with you if they get something. And after two or three times, uh, you probably try to see if there is some element of respect and reciprocity. If the answer is no, get them out of your life, do a social detox and you'll be fine. Yeah, what a what a practical tactical way. So everyone listening and watching, think, you know that the, the buy me a coffee concept. You know that's why I've just coined it in my mind. Um, I love that. It's it's we you know a lot a lot of us are givers, but almost to a fault, right? And so at some point, just like in your example, um, you have to do an ask just to make sure that everyone still has a level playing field because there has to be that reciprocity, as you mentioned. I I love I love how you encapsulated that. Um, 
something you said also before we got on and I want to continue and time is flying. So um, I wanted to, I wanted to really break this down because I wrote it down when you first mentioned it. I want to get into this concept of missionary versus mercenary. And I think it probably goes along with what we just talked about. So as a leader, being a CEO for your life, you, you're going to have to, you're going to wear many different hats, right? But you got to pick either the missionary. I want to know, do you have to pick being a missionary and mercenary, or can you work between both? This is what I wanted to ask you. So maybe you can define both for us. And then do you move back and forth between those, or do you just normally have to pick one or the other? Oh, this, is, this is a very good question. And uh, incidentally, I gave a speech uh, to, to a big company in the US last week, exactly on this thing. No, I, I don't want to, 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 to convey that you need to choose between uh, being a great guy or being successful financially. Um, because then it's a bit of a romantic and quite frankly, simplistic way of putting. What, what I'm simply trying to say is that you start uh, with, uh, with why you're doing certain, certain things. Now, so many years ago, I always start with this quote that I put it in my book as well. Is a quote from uh, Mark Twain uh, that said, the two most important days of your life are the day where you're born and the day where you find out why. No? So you find out why is fundamentally, you know, why you're doing what you're doing. So Simon Sinek, uh, respectfully, has not invented anything because uh, there was the, the Greek uh, uh, philosopher that started about uh, meaning and purpose longer before uh, Simon Sinek wrote about it. Okay, so uh, start with why or start with the mission. Is starting, you know, why the second day of your life uh, you find out why is fundamentally reflecting of uh, regardless of the company, regardless of the role. Why are you doing what you're doing? What, do you have a mission or you just have a job and a paycheck at the end of the month? And the mission could be different from different people in different organizations in different, in different, in different, kind, of a, in different kind of roles. No? When, you, when you anchored your being, your professional skills in that mission, usually you're successful and therefore financial return will come to you. Uh, but you don't start by the financial dimension because then uh, you, you, you fundamentally cut the root of what you, who you are and you just go straight uh, to, uh, to, uh, um, to the financial element. And, and this usually is not a good recipe to be successful and usually it's not a good re uh, recipe to be ethical as well. So uh, to me, it's not about all you choose to be a missionary or mercenary. Choose a, a job, a profession, that is uh, mission driven for you. And then uh, in my view, you're going to be able to flourish. And by doing this, uh, you're going to be able to, to be successful. CEOs uh, have a very important role, which is to make sure that people have a very strong mission in their understanding. They understand uh, the direction, the vision, and usually they're able to do this by storytelling. It's not by KPIs, it's not by financial results. Leave this to the CFOs. Just make sure that people understand the journey that you're going to go through. And by doing this, uh, they will follow you. <laughs> it's so good. I'm trying to just, I'm just trying to marinate what you just said. <clears throat> as far as, oh boy, I'm um, trying to figure out how I want to kind of bring some of this together. You mentioned storytelling. And I think this, there was two things I wanted to pull threads on. One is um, when you were last talking, should I, what if I'm not successful in six months, Paolo? Should I change? Should I, I mean, how soon should I, should I be successful? I guess is my question. No, I mean, it, it depends on how you measure success. Okay. And uh, let me, let me, let me give you, sorry, let me put the light on because it's getting dark here. It's close to eight in the evening here in Geneva. Yeah. Uh, it, it depends on, um, how you measure success. And now let me give you perhaps a, a, a funny story because my first work uh, was a Citibank. No? So I was 22 years old, 23, and off you go. I'm a young kid, literally young kid uh, from Milan, going to Citibank and, and taking my, you know, my, my, my first day at work. And I remember the day was uh, February 1st, uh, 1989. So long time ago, as you can see. No? And so the senior guy from Citibank comes, uh, and I forgot his name, but he was a senior guy. He, he was wearing, you know, the, how do you call the, you know, it was a typical, you know, almost like from a, 
from the um, from a movie. Anyway, the guy comes uh, and uh, he said, "Okay, guys, how old are you?" And we all were like between twenty three and twenty six, you know. And the starting salary I remember was nineteen thousand dollars. Okay, that was the starting salary at that time. And uh, he said, "Okay, get your salary multiplied by six. So we do the math. Okay, and then he said, "Add fifty. And so we had 50. And then he said, if this is not your salary in two years' time, you are a loser. That's what he told us. Okay. So here, here I am. I'm, I'm the first moment of my first day. And the first thing that I'm hearing is a senior guy is telling me your success is based on your salary in three years' time. We started with a shitty salary because of $19,000 in New York. It was not a luxury life, I can tell you. Uh, yeah. But we were all prepared to say, you know what, I'm going to work hard and and eventually get to 150K by the age in which I'm 25, okay? That was his definition of salary, of, of success. Exactly. I'm not criticizing mm -hmm. City Group, which is, I think is a great organization. I'm proud to work over there. But is the idea that I had of success at that age was I have to make as much money as possible, as fast as possible. Uh, in my book, uh, I'm trying to convey a different idea, which is... a. Uh, of course, so we need to make money, you know, pay mortgage, mortgages and, and send the kids to school and, and all the rest. And of course, of course, and there's no doubt about this, but I will really sure you can define success exclusively from this parameter, or do we have something different? And uh, I start the book by, by a story about my dad, uh, because uh, my dad, you know, when uh, you know, used to work in Brazil and uh, for Olivetti, an Italian company, and he came back to Italy to pick me up from school uh, the first day of school. And uh, I, I have a twin sister, so he came to, from Brazil to pick us up. Uh, and, uh, and then on the way back, we, we chat, and then uh, um, he took me to my sister first and then myself to, to another room, and he said, Paolo, from, and I would told all the stories about the first day of school. And then he told me, Paolo, you know, from tomorrow, I won't be here in Milan anymore, I'm going back to Brazil. Uh, so you cannot tell me any stories, but I'd like you to reflect on three very simple questions, which is, first of all, do you love what you're doing? Second, are you helping other people? Third, are you learning something new? Uh, re remember these three questions as you go to school every day. And I generally believe that, uh, you know, the, the writing of my book started that day, and I was 60 years old, and now I'm 57, so more than 50 years ago, because the way I, I define my own success uh, is based on these three parameters. One, do I learn something new? And the answer is usually yes. For example, in this conversation with you today, for which I'm very grateful. Secondly, I'm helping other people. I hope I do, at least I'm trying. And three, do I love what I do? Fuck it, I do. And I really love it. And therefore, uh, to me, my successful, my, my idea of success uh, is having fun. And when I say fun, I mean uh, in a meaningful way, not in a teenager way, in, in, in a way that makes sense to me. Uh, I believe I'm able to help people with my books, with my lectures, with my articles, with my coaching, and, and in whatever activity I performed. And on the learning side, uh, bloody hell, every day is a, an amazing opportunity of learning. Um, in books, uh, in, in talking to people, in, uh, in getting into different projects, different situations. COVID-19 has been uh, an MBA in surviving for all of us on the planet. So it's, 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 it's tragic, absolutely yes, but it's also an amazing opportunity to reestablish learning and to reset the way we learn in a way that has never happened before. So if you, if you look at these three elements in, in your professional journey, learning, loving, and helping, I think you may have a, a very successful career. Yeah, absolutely, Paolo. Wow. Um, okay, so I wanted to, so I, have, I wrote one other thing down um, in preparation for our talk, which was um, the thoughts. Uh, we've learned so much from you today, and I really appreciate it. Just my mind is just like firecrackers going off. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the, in the sea, because you've talked a lot about mission and compass and your radar, the bigger vision and knowing those things. So I think a key element to being a good CEO for life or being a good leader is the ability to bring people along with you. And you're a masterful storyteller. I love your story in one of your talks about Lord Byron in his cohorts, you know, in this Italian villa, villa and they're, you know, they're writing, you know, Dr well, the beginnings of Dracula and Frankenstein and how all this came about. And then you tie that into what you're communicating. 
Talk a little bit about the importance of being a good storyteller to be able to communicate mission, vision, to bring people along as a leader. I, I wanted to get that from you because I think you're masterful at it. Uh, listen, uh, I, I've learned a lot from um, from many amazing people, and um, I always, 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 always quote Bruce Springsteen, which is to me is one of my hero. No, but uh, think about. Uh, I want to bring you in a practical experience. Now, uh, I, I I work in many organizations, and the one that I love the most uh, is the World Bank uh, in Washington D.C. Now, I spent twelve years in Washington D.C. I lived in, in in the States for many years. Is a country that I immensely respect and love uh, on so many level. It doesn't mean that I agree with everything, but you know, it's a country that I, I still have American flag in my in my in my dining room just to to, to let to let you know. No. Um, so you, you work for the World Bank, there are 22,000 people in 140 different countries and, uh, and uh, they come from all over the globe with a huge amount of diversity. So then the question is, how do you bring these guys together? They are in different places, different values, different political ideas, age, profession, background, sexual preference, religion. It, it, it's, it's, it's an amazing mess to a certain extent. No? So what brings <laughs> people together? No? What brings people together is actually the mission of the World Bank, okay? Mm -hmm. is, is the purpose, uh, and I uh, want to be very practical. Pro to me, the best day of my life, uh, I mean life uh, when I was at the World Bank, was the first moment, uh, the first, uh, sorry, Tuesday of the month, so, in which all the newcomers uh, from uh, the World Bank uh, met for a, a week uh, of induction, okay? So you have people coming from Guatemala, Brazil, Morocco, Thailand, China, Kenya, South Africa, whatever, all coming to DC for one week, for a week of induction. And uh, um, sadly for them, I was the first person that they met, okay, because I was the guy running the show, I mean, the human resources. And so I remember in this room, 120, 150, 200 people, every month coming from all over the globe, uh, to be trained for the induction, okay? And initially, you know, I ask, uh, hey, what do you do? And I say, I'm a financial analyst, blah, 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 blah. But then, 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 then I stop asking, what do you do? And I start asking, why are you here? Why are you here? Right. And, uh, and, and a lot of them left uh, uh, very good jobs. Uh, most of them even highly paid uh, than, uh, than the work at the World Bank. Uh, and so I didn't ask, uh, what is your role? Uh, where do you work? Uh, what is your title? What is your level? I say, so help me to understand why you're here. Okay. Yeah. And I remember one day I had two people sitting in the same desk. One was a driver from a, a relatively poor country in, uh, in South America. And the other one was a former prime minister of a very important country. So these two guys were like, you know, one, you know, very important guy. The other guy was a probably a different more universe. Hard. And I asked, hey, you know, why are you here? And they responded in the same way. And they responded to say, because we want to fight injustice and we want to, to help uh, my country to be in a better shape. And so mm -hmm. storytelling is not uh, becoming a comedian, okay? Because uh, when we had comedians like uh, Berlusconi uh, in my country, uh, that, that was not good. Uh, storytelling is to able to convey a narrative that is convincing because it's rooted in people's DNA. It's not, it, it, in a way, it doesn't, doesn't go only here, it goes here, it goes in your heart. Uh, it goes love in that, heart. love that. So yes. when, when, when you do this and you convey and, and people understand this and internalize it, you have amazing missionaries. And let me be a more, another, you know, when you send people to Yemen, uh, to uh, Haiti after earthquake, uh, in uh, war-infested countries, in Syria, you cannot convince them to go to say, well, maybe next year you get a 3% salary increase. They won't go for that reason. They will go because they believe in what they're doing. So the capacity of a CEO to tell a narrative that is convincing because authentic is to me the quintessential skills of every CEO. You know, you just, Palat, that's just amazing. You reminded me of something that was told to me a long time ago, and I haven't really thought about it much lately. I was asked by someone, he said, uh, he said, do you know what the longest distance in the universe is? And I was like, um, no, I, whatever, tell me. And uh, he said, the distance between the head and the heart. And he said, anyone who can bring those two distances, that distance smaller will be successful. If you can bring your head and your heart together and bridge those two things, 
you're on your way to being successful. And, uh, and I love how you, you brought that analogy about the head and the heart and, uh, and focusing on the heart. So that's, that's awesome. I loved our conversation. I mean, I knew it was going to be wonderful. I mean, I could go on for hours talking to you. <laughs> Have mercy on the listeners. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but um, I know, uh, I know this is a this is a beginning of a great relationship, and I thank you for the time. It's been extremely valuable. I, I hope anyone listening has got a lot out of this. And and like I say with all our guests, if you're listening to this, please, please, please bring this to life. Paolo's a real person, even though he's halfway around the world. I was able to contact him through LinkedIn. He's a good person. He got back to me. So if any of this resonates with you, please, I'm going to link information above or below wherever you're watching or listening to this and get in touch with Paolo. He's an incredible mind. Um, obviously, you hear he's a caring person and uh, and reach out for him. So Paolo, thanks for spending the time with us today and sharing us about our compass and our radar and about our mission and how we can be better successful leaders and the CEO for our life. So I love it. Thanks. No, thank you. I'm grateful for being invited here and to share these thoughts with you. Grazie, I really, I really appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Thanks, Paolo. All right, everyone, we'll see you on the next episode of the CEO for Life Experience and uh, go out and gain full control of your life. Thanks.